deliver the keynote. Thanks very much, Sue, to John, Felicia, Andrew McAvoy, the CEO of Tourism Australia, Anthony Hayes from Queensland Tourism, ladies and gentlemen. It is such a pleasure to be here today to have the opportunity to address the ATIP Symposium, appropriately on the Sunshine Coast, one of Australia's favourite holiday destinations. Also extend my congratulations to the ATIP organisation on its 40th anniversary. I only wish I could say, stay to see the rest of the ads, it would be a most entertaining afternoon. That aside, my friends, can I say, when I think back, and I actually discuss the 40 years with people like John King, I think it's fair to say that the organisation has made some remarkable achievements over the 40 years. It's contributed in a constructive way to key policy debates and been a strong advocate for Australia's tourism industry over that 40 years. Thanks for a job well done. I'm here today principally to continue to encourage you to do the work which is so vital to the tourism industry, a key part of the Australian economy, and in doing so to encourage you to continue to work with governments of all political persuasions at a state and federal level, to work in a constructive way, and in doing so to build on your achievements to grow the Australian tourism industry. Your contribution has and will continue to prove vital as Australian tourism faces two fundamental changes that will change the industry forever. The first is appropriately the other part of my portfolio, the mining boom and structural changes which are imposed on the tourism industry in the Australian economy as a result of that pressure. The second, I think, is obvious to us all. It's the immense economic growth in Asia dramatically changing the composition of tourists visiting Australia. These changes we all accept present challenges, but they also present opportunities. They come from a common source, the economic growth of Asia through demand for our resources and a rising middle class eager to travel. We estimate that by the end of this decade, there will be 100 billion, in Ch 100 million alone out of China seeking to go overseas out of a population of 1.3 billion. The government therefore has a strong focus on growing the number of visitors from the booming Asian region. With China as the driver, visitors from Asia will generate close to 19 billion a year by 2020. Inbound arrivals from the region are forecast to increase by 4% to 2.5 million in 2011-12 and by a further 5.6% to 2.6 million in 2012-13. By contrast, arrivals from other regions combined, including Europe and North America, are predicted to rise by 1.1% in 2012-13. However, the expected boom in Asian tourism should not be seen as a given. ATEC is making a valuable contribution to our focus on Asia through the government's Tourism 2020 strategy. You're also involved in formulating the Australia in the Asian Century White Paper examining the opportunities provided by Asia's economic and structural changes. The Australian Government has and will continue to work with individual tourism operators and industry associations such as ATEC to help ensure, ensure we make the most of the growth in travellers from Asia. Key to ensuring we are an attractive destination with repeat visits and recommendations to friends and relatives is the quality of the travel experience in Australia. We should never forget that Australia was the first Western country, along with New Zealand, to enter the approved destination scheme, becoming an ADS destination in 1999. How fortunate we were as an industry. The ADS scheme provides streamlined travel opportunities for Chinese tour groups to Australia and an assurance as to quality for our Chinese guests. With ADS tour groups making up around half of all Chinese visitation to Australia, if the quality is not up to scratch, and we should never forget this, Australia will miss out appropriately on further growth from this vital market. It is therefore vital that the Code of Ethics, which applies to ADS approved operators, underpinning the ADS scheme, applied strictly to ensure professional high quality service for Chinese visitors. Just this week, 
I was forced to suspend an ADS operator for three months for breaches of the code. Last year, two operators were suspended for fundamental breaches of the code. While I take no pleasure as the Minister in suspending operators, I make no apologies for rigorously enforcing the code and my determination to ensure the integrity in the ADS scheme. The reasoning is simple. If Australia does not offer good, good holiday experiences, Chinese visitors will not return or recommend Australia to their friends and family. The damage to brand Australia of bad holiday experiences cannot be underestimated. Quality is vital. But if we are to compete with tourism providers elsewhere for the Chinese market, we must also invest in China being ready. The government has provided 40 million for new tourism products and services across the country through the TQOL grants program. This includes the 600,000 welcome, welcoming Chinese visitors strategic tourism investment grant, which will provide training and support to businesses looking to improve their readiness for Chinese visitors. Applications to deliver this program close with my department on the 20th of April, and they are currently being assessed. I also recently allocated a million dollars to translate the Australian Tourism Data Warehouse's accommodation, product and experiences information into Chinese. Today I'm pleased to announce a further significant boost in our efforts to promote Australia tourism in China. The government will provide funding to Tourism Australia to build a China-based website to deliver the Australian tourism message in a tailored way. With over 500 million Chinese citizens alone, it is vital we reach them to promote great Australian holidays. A locally based .cn website will provide Australia's tourism industry an advantage over its competitors. This site will carry safety, security and consumer information, which are essential if Australia is to realise the potential of free independent travel from the Chinese market. Taken together, this package of projects represents a strong start to welcoming Chinese visitors to Australia. But these alone, ladies and gentlemen, are not enough. Innovative initiatives are required by industry. The challenge to industry is to devise and implement ideas to ensure Chinese visitors have a quality, safe and enjoyable experience that they will recommend to their friends and family. The very issues John spoke about in his introductory address from an innovation point of view. It is in China and Asia more generally that we see many opportunities for tourism as a nation. But there are also opportunities there for picking, on the, for picking up on the back of the extraordinary mining boom we are experiencing. The challenges the resources boom poses to the tourism sector are well known. The high Australian dollar, partly caused by commodity prices, and the competition for labour from resources companies does harm tourism competitiveness. The same pressures, I might add, are being faced by many other service industries and the manufacturing industry. Tourism Research Australia is currently undertaking research into the impact of the mining boom on tourism. I hope to release the second phase of this research shortly, which builds on the research released in November of last year. What initial research has shown is that it is important to note that the mining boom can also be of benefit to tourism. Importantly, the mining boom is increasing Australia's wealth and creating jobs. This wealth flows through the economy, including to tourism. In particular, accommodation providers and domestic aviation in certain regions are benefiting to a large extent. The rise in business travel is very healthy indeed, with business travel up 6% in 2011, nights up 4% and expenditure up 8%. I acknowledge demand for aviation and hotels can drive up prices and squeeze supply for holiday makers, but the additional supply and investment are of a long-term benefit to tourism. More flights to regional areas will carry, to, carry tourists to places such as Geraldton, Mackay and Darwin. The high Australian dollar due to demand for our commodities 
is also helping drive down petrol prices relative to other countries than they would otherwise be. Imagine if the Australian dollar was below 50 US cents as it was in 2001. Just think what the price of petrol would be at the pump today if that was the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, tourism would certainly bear the brunt of a low dollar combined with high oil prices, higher airfares and even greater costs to fill the car tank. Importantly, let us not forget that without the mining boom, we would have to assume a weaker China and a corresponding reduction in visitors from Asia that would go with that. You cannot have one without the other. The mining boom is a sign of a growing Asia and a growing Asian market for Australian tourisms. When ATEC commenced 40 years ago, the focus was on New Zealand, North America and Europe. It's also appropriate to acknowledge that it was 40 years ago this year that we also, one of the first nations at the time, entered into formal diplomatic relations with China. Forty years on, those decisions to establish ATEC and Australian government recognition of China have proven to be very, very significant for the future of the tourism industry in Australia. I therefore acknowledge ATEC's efforts to overcome what is potentially the biggest challenge to our embrace of Asia's opportunities, skills and labour shortages, including appropriately a focus on increased employment of people of an Indigenous background. Australia requires an estimated 56,000 more tourism workers by 2015 to meet expected demand. This need is most pronounced in regional areas where competition for labour with the resources sector is fierce. The government has therefore tackled the issue by implementing 11 of the 12 recommendations from last year's Tourism Employment Roundtable. These include the development of tourism employment plans for eight tourist hosts, tourism hotspots throughout Australia, a trial of the seasonal worker program to bring labour from the tourism industry from the Pacific region and East Timor. With respect to East Timor, the program has already commenced to be put in place in Broome. This program can provide an important labour boost during peak times to some of our most short staffed tourism regions. My department is therefore clearly working very closely with the Queensland Tourism Organisation at the moment with respect to trying to really trial this seasonal work program in some key se seasonal tourism opportunities such as the islands off the coast. However, it is imperative that the program is successful if it is to be extended further or made permanent. Industry must grab this opportunity with both hands, use it and use it wisely. I have asked the government to sign a memorandum of understanding with relevant state tourism councils and tourism organisations to encourage update and monitor this program. I have to prove at the cabinet table each time I get a breakthrough on these initiatives that the tourism industry is actually going to take them up and drive them and make sure that they are used. If you don't, you undermine my capacity from a whole of government point of view to actually get other ministers with portfolio responsibilities for some of these initiatives on board. Part of that is also a template labour agreement which has been developed to provide industry with easier access to overseas, work, overseas workers for occupations with critical shortages. The tools for attracting and retaining workers now exist. It is up to all of us to work together in partnership to maximise our access and usage of these initiatives. The twelfth recommendation advocated by ATIC goes to the extension of the working holiday visa maker opportunity to tourism workers. ATIC has been a strong advocate of this change and I acknowledge its leadership. The proposal is currently with the government and is under direct consideration. I hope to respond as soon as possible. I simply say that the Minister for Migration, Chris Bowen, who has responsibility for this program as Immigration Minister, is very much aware of the industry's needs and through some of the reforms I've outlined this morning, has been very receptive to the needs of this industry. I must say the breakthroughs I've made on a range of fronts from a Labor perspective over the last 12 months have been very, willing, very much due to the willingness of Chris Bowen to work with me with respect to the special needs of the tourism industry and I give him full credit. 
I then go to the issue of looking to the future. I simply say it's important for us to focus on demand as well as the supply side of the tourism market. Andrew McAvoy will obviously give a key presentation today in terms of the work of Tourism Australia and I must say Tourism Australia is going exceptionally well. Can I also give full support to their desire to speak with One Voice internationally which is clearly part and parcel of the core work and ambition of ATEC. But once again, government industry must collaborate to increase the appeal and awareness of our opportunities throughout Asia. We must also gain a greater understanding of the nature of individual Asian tourism markets and the expectations of their people. ATEC made this point last year in a clear submission to the white paper I mentioned earlier. Tourism Australia's planning for the next financial year allocates 69% of its budget to Asia, a huge increase from the 15% figure for the current year. A phased rollout of spending will see Tourism Australia active in 30 Chinese cities by 2020, up from 10 at present, and I will soon launch the next phase of There's Nothing Like Australia campaign in Shanghai next month with Andrew and the Chair of Tourism Australia, Jeff Dixon. Ongoing research is also important so as to help increase awareness of how to engage with customers in these locations. Tourism Australia, Tourism Australia therefore expects to launch a similar India 2020 plan in mid-2012 and marketing pushes in other key markets will follow. Tourism operators can help the cause by assessing government resources or conducting their own market research and promotions. I simply say from my perspective, as Minister, I have encouraged Tourism Australia not only to go out of its way to work with all state and, tourism, state and territory tourism organisations, but also, as it has in more recent years, to form closer partnerships with key representatives of industry. Can I say in conclusion that today I've outlined some of the foundations for realising, hopefully, the tourism potential in Asia, but it is not a given. More and more other strong competitors and the recent entrances to the United States are focusing on Asia and the opportunities in places such as China. Therefore, government industry and even members of the general public must build on these opportunities at a rapid rate. And we are to create an Australia that welcomes our neighbours and encourages them to return. I ask all members of ATEC to become familiar with the Tourism 2020 plan and its various programs is about practical opportunities to improve our performance. Please do not hesitate to seize its incentives and opportunities as they become available. The Asian Century, ladies and gentlemen, is now firmly underway and we have no time to lose if we are to make the most of it. I thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon and in doing so, wish you all the very best for a successful symposium. Thank you. Uh, stay on stage and join us on the panel because we now we move on to the panel mining for international tourists. Please welcome joining me on the panel.